this is uh, chapter three. It's a probably the most important chapter that we will cover uh, in this course. It's a complicated chapter. <coughs> um, it's complicated in the sense that there's a lot of detail, and I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna um, sugarcoat this. A lot is riding on your mastery of this chapter. Most of the first exam is going to depend on this, on your understanding of this chapter. But really, your kind of key takeaways from this entire course depends on this chapter and on this lecture. So the best advice I can give you is that if you're not reading many chapters of the book, make this one of the chapters that you read. And if you don't watch lectures more than once, make this the chapter that's an exception. Um, it's just a complicated, um, it's just a complicated chapter and um, complicated again in the sense that not the material itself is complicated, just the volume of the material. Because there are three things that we're going to do in this chapter. First, looking at demand, then looking at supply, then bringing it all together with equilibrium. So we need to do three things in this chapter. And that's quite a bit to do. Okay, so I'm just going to skip over um, these outlines and objectives. So let's preface this chapter with a little bit of material that's not in, in the book. Um, as this slide implies, what we are looking at here is how the market system works. So from a um, questioning perspective, the objective of this chapter is to defend the market system, and that's what the capitalists need. So it, it's, it's not that this is necessarily um, part of a not to be questioned um, economic science. There's an objective, defend capitalism. And demand and supply become the way that we can structure a market system as existing which in itself gives rise to capitalism. All of this depends on what's known as a circular flow model. And again, what we have going on in that circular flow model is that we have households, we have businesses, and we have the government. And then we have households selling their labor to businesses, businesses selling their products to households, households paying for those goods and services, and businesses paying for the labor. So you get this sense that things are flowing. And then the government is giving services to businesses, giving services to households. Households are paying taxes. Businesses are paying taxes. Governments are buying goods and services. Governments are hiring workers. In that circular flow model, you have to remember that that circular flow model and understanding how goods and services and money are all flowing in the system and that that's part of, um, that that's part of um, supply and demand. Well, one thing that's going on here as well is that um, And one thing that's going on here as well 
is the idea that um, there's harmony. Everyone is working together. Everyone is self-interested, but yet at the same time, everyone is working together. But there's peace. Nowhere in this discussion are we going to see any tension, class conflict that exists between households and businesses, even though in reality we know they are. And that in other economic models, that class conflict defines the market. And you're not going to see that here. <clears throat> These are just some of the things I want you to keep in mind as we're um, starting to go um, through this chapter. Okay. Let's look at this a little bit um, clearer. So again, here's our three decision-making bodies, the firm or the business, the entrepreneur, the person that's taking the risks, and then you've got the households. And among these three groups, again, here's our circular flow model. We have two markets, a goods market, like an output market and an input market, the, the workers. So here's a much nicer looking um, circular flow model. This circular flow model, the reason why we're covering it is it's kind of the background behind the supply and demand curve. But again, look at that picture. No conflict. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by saying no conflict? Right here, you know, one of the conflicts we see, for instance, in the United States is um, and in some states more than others, but we're seeing it really much more so as of late, is do workers have a right to collectively bargain, to form a union? Businesses want to say no. Households are increasingly demanding that right to be able to do that. Um, businesses don't want to give households a right to repair their products. Um, workers want to have a um, want to have health insurance that comes with every job. And there's conflict, right? We do boycotts of businesses that you know um, right there's that one uh, restaurant. what's the name of that restaurant? Uh, Chick-fil-A, right? Isn't it the, it's like they've got, they're the, that's that restaurant that has a, um, a pretty strong, um, you know, kind of Christian um, conservative background, right? And then there's protests of certain customers that they don't want to um, support a business that has such strong views. Um And certainly the pandemic with COVID has certainly not made this much easier either. But what you see here then are households and businesses that are um, interacting peacefully in two markets, a goods market and an input market. Okay. We as workers, all of us, um, we obviously are supplying our labor and we're getting wages in return. We also could own resources, natural resources that we um, sell to others. So that's our um, inputs market. And that labor market is one of just um, other factors of production. Again, there would be a, a, a land market, um, another natural resource market that then flows into, or that these are the positions where um, households are supplying certain things, businesses are demanding certain things, and that there's a flow of money on the other side. With that in mind, that circular flow model now has to give rise to um, some form of demand. Now, before we get to this 
slide here. Let me just insert a slide here. So I think it's helpful just to define what it is that we're trying to understand. The simplest way to define demand is the willingness and ability um, to buy a good at any particular price, ceteris paribus. Ceteris paribus meaning all of the things being constant, held equal. Nothing changing at all. Now, what would be those things that are changing? Those things that are possibly changing is this list that we get right here. So what we're saying is that if we hold these things constant, that there's a relationship between the price of the product and the quantity of the product. That there's some relationship between these two. Economics is all about understanding what the nature of that relationship is. And if we look at what that relationship is, that relationship is one where um, the relationship is one where the individual units bought is the quantity demanded for each particular price with that ceteris paribus. And what it does is it gives rise to a law of demand. Now, keep in mind, neoclassical economists are calling this a law of demand because they want to make it seem like a law of nature or a law of how markets work. But what it would say is ceteris paribus, meaning holding all these other variables constant, there's an inverse relationship. between the price of the product and the quantity demanded. There's an inverse relationship. What do we mean by inverse? We're saying here that they move in the opposite direction. When one is going up, the other is going down, and vice versa. And that's what we see right here. When price increases, quantity demanded decreases. Important point right here. I did not say demand decreased. I said quantity demanded increased. It's very important. You have to say both, you have to say quantity demanded. You cannot just say demand when you're just changing the price of the good itself. Now, 
what could if I change any of that other stuff, such as income, price of other products, preferences, um, um, just trying to think of some easier kind of things here, preferences, income, prices of other products, um, time frame, future price. If I change any one of these other variables, any of the things that were subject to the ceteris paribus, so let's say I, I relax that assumption, then there's going to be a change in demand. And this, and this, are not the same. These two things mean something very different. And I'm making the slide look really messy just to highlight for you the fact that they are in fact different. Let's review where we're at right now. And we're only on slide 14. We started out this discussion by saying that there's a circular flow model that can describe the country or the world or society. That in this circular flow model, there are two markets, an input market and an output market. And in these two markets, this is where the buyer and the seller interact with each other in a peaceful, cooperative way. And um, that it's in this kind of market that um, the buyer is buying something, the seller is selling something, and that it's within those markets where you get, um, it's within those markets where you get some prices that are emerging. If we want to talk about how those prices are being um, determined, then um, it, within those markets, if something's being determined, the um, we need to talk about demand and supply. That demand as a function demand as a function a bunch of different variables. Let's just count it. Here. Six different variables. But when we talk about demand, to make our life a little bit easy and to understand the relationship between quantity and price, we're going to hold variables two through six constant. Holding variables two through six constant is called ceteris paribus. So we're basically at this point saying demand is a function of all of those variables. Now, what happens is that when we hold two through six constant and we only look at the relationship between the price over here and the quantity over here. What's the nature of that relationship? Is that there's an inverse or opposing relationship between the two. When we just change the price of the product, and say now we have the price decreasing. Then we say that the quantity 
demanded increases. So there's a change in the quantity demanded. And all I was saying here is that this is different. To say quantity demanded changes is not the same thing as saying demand is changing. Demand changes when you change variables two through six. So we need to understand both of those aspects. Okay, so what that means then is that we can graph out both a demand curve and we can write out a demand schedule that would show all the various prices where someone would buy things for different prices and then we can graph that out. Uh, the way that would look here, so here's an example for Alex. Here I've got the price going down and the quantity demanded is increasing. Now the way that I'm going to write this is Q subscript D. If you write it out like that, that's a way of writing out the fact that quantity demanded is increasing. as the price is falling. Price is falling, quantity demanded is increasing. Inverse relationship between the two. Think of your own purchasing habits. Um, as the price, as something becomes cheaper, you tend to buy more of it. You tend to substitute towards that good that's getting cheaper in price. Um, the quantity demanded is increasing as the price falls. This is the law of demand. As the price falls, ceteris paribus, the quantity demanded increases. And that that looks like this. Let's insert a slide here. And let's call this how to draw demand. On the x-axis would be the quantity of the product. On the y-axis would be the price of the product. And this is just describing a single product. So let's call it oranges. Let's say that we're doing this for oranges. Then what we're saying here is that when the price is very high, that the quantity demanded is very low. When the price is very low, the quantity demanded is very high. And we can just kind of connect the dots. These points are the points of quantity demanded, but the curve or the collection of all of the quantity demanded points is the demand. So the whole curve is the demand. The individual points are the quantity demanded points. Now, if the price falls and I go from point A to point B, how would we describe that movement from A to B? Well, the first thing we would say is that demand didn't change. The curve is still the same. 
this line did not change. But I moved along the curve. So I moved along the curve. From A to B, the price fell, right? And it did fall. But then also what happened is that the quantity demanded increased. Remember, quantity demanded, not demand. If you're already seeing, at least graphically now, some um, evidence of the fact that um, seeing that the quantity demanded changed, um, seeing that the quantity demanded changed is a very distinct thing. Here we're saying that it's meaning that I'm moving along a constant demand curve. Okay, let's go back to that cute picture that they had right here. So that's kind of what we're seeing here. We're seeing that this demand curve has a negative slope. So that is, in some sense, highlighting. the inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. As the price falls, the quantity demanded increases. The collection of all those quantity demanded points together gives us the entire demand curve. there finally they are telling us now the law of demand the law of demand is what we use to um, describe that slope the fact that there is that inverse relationship so neoclassical economics needs to have a market whereas the price falls people buy more that sends the signal the signal that's used to tell producers right how much to produce. Okay, let me pause it right here. Okay, so what the law of demand does, just to, to repeat myself here, um, what the law of demand does for us is it describes um, the slope of the demand curve, that it has a negative slope. And again, what it does for us, it says that if we have a market Uh, let me make that look bad here. Let's just make it a market for computers. That there's an x-axis where it's the quantity of that product. And there's a y-axis where it's the price of that product. And that when the price is very high, people don't buy very many computers. When the price is very low, People do buy a lot of computers. And then we have some in-between points here. These points, where I still have not drawn a line connecting them, these are each individual quantity demanded points. It's just saying when price is high, people don't buy much. When price is low, people buy a lot. Once we... connect the line, the dots, that whole graph is our demand curve, which has a negative slope described by the law of demand. And that the law of demand says, ceteris paribus, again, that means holding variables 
2 through 6 constant, the 2 through 6 being that earlier slide where we had all the variables listed, that there is a negative relationship between the price and the quantity demanded. That's all that the law of demand tells us. That there's an inverse relationship between the price and the quantity demanded. Um, let's just get rid of what we have here on the side here. Um, You eliminated all my stuff there. Well, hopefully you wrote down what you were supposed to be writing down. Um, the demand curve, again, has a negative slope. That's our law of demand. Um, and it does intersect the x-axis and the y-axis. Um, it's not too important. Um, You know, because for technical reasons, we wouldn't say the quantity is ever zero or that the price is zero. But, um, I mean, technically speaking, this demand curve does intersect both the x-axis and the y-axis. The shape of the curve, although it is negative, different... Um, products are going to have different slopes depending on the product that it is and the unique preferences that we have for some of the products. So now let's look at the other variables. That would be variables here. Again, 2 through 6. So that's what we're going to do now, is that we're going to look at all of those variables. So let's start with income. And when we're talking about variables two through six, now we're talking about the entire curve shifting. And that this can change in one of two ways. Either my um, income or wealth could go up or my income or wealth could go down. Um, so this is... Um, Variable number two. And what it's going to do so now the the point of conversation is now changing. Um, we used to say, how many more computers would you buy when they are cheaper? And we just said you'd buy more computers when they are cheaper. Now we're saying, how many computers would you buy when you are richer? The difference is that now you buy more computers at each and every price. What does that mean? So here's my old demand curve. Okay. So I bought, let's say, one computer when the price was $1,000. And then I bought two computers when the price was $800. And three and it was $600, and four, and it was $500, and five, and it was $200. It doesn't matter what the numbers are that I'm using here. 
It just matters that the price is going down and the quantity is going up. Now, I'm saying that this is for a single person. In economics, we allow the individuals to be added up to constitute the entire market. That is a bit of a critique that we can also make against the neoclassicals. It's a presumption of methodological individualism. Something is not presumed to be different just when we add everyone up. We can just add up everyone together, lay, lay those individual demands on top of each other. Not exactly the way we would typically do this, but that is the way that we're doing that in this model. And now what we're saying is that Um, let's put this in uh, blue. If my income increases, now at the price of a thousand, let's say I'm willing to buy two and three now at 800 and so on and so forth because I'm now just richer. And so at each and every price, I'm willing to buy more. Now, that's not true of every good. But typically, when the income goes up, I buy more at each and every price. The demand increased. Let's make a new slide here just to highlight what we got going on here. The increase in quantity demanded as opposed to the increase in demand is a difference that looks like this. That's why it's so important what words you use, because they look different. Increase in quantity demanded. This is our law of demand at work. Change the price leads to change. That's the delta here. Changing the price leads to a change in the quantity demanded. Here we're saying a change in income leads to a change in demand. Looks very different. Here, We have ceteris paribus going on. We're not changing those variables two through six. We're only changing the price. And we're just saying when things are cheaper, people buy more. That's all we're saying here. Because of ceteris paribus, the demand curve itself stays the same. That the quantity 
demanded increases as price falls over here we're saying we're saying here that the quantity demanded increases at each and every price at each and every price the quantity demanded is higher because here we're allowing variables two through six to change again what are variables two through six variables two through six those variables right there when I change this that causes a movement either to the left I'm sorry to the right or to the left along the curve when I change these, I'm either increasing demand or I'm going to be decreasing demand. This here. is an increase in quantity demanded. This is an increase in demand. This is a decrease in quantity demanded. This is a decrease in demand. Very different. Now, not every good is going to be a good where if you increase the income that the demand shifts to the right or that there's an increase in demand. Because there's a special set of goods where when you become richer, you stop buying that good. As an example, um, when I had my very first teaching position, I'd just gotten out of graduate school, I'd just gotten my doctorate, but dude, I was still pretty poor. And I was so poor, in fact, that I didn't have a dependable car and I took the bus to work every day. Um, I took the Route 151 in St. Louis and I take that bus to work and back every day. Um, you know, I, I, you know, public transportation is different in every city, but I didn't like doing it. I mean, I did it because I had to, but, you know, it's just, it's inconvenient. It's a little bit unsafe. And um, I just didn't like it. And so once I worked long enough and my student loans were paid off and I had enough income, I stopped doing it. So my demand for the bus pass decreased as my income went up. Just as my demand for ramen noodles decreased when I got my first job. So most goods are what we call normal goods. Where demand for the good goes up when the income is higher and demand goes down when the income goes lower. But there is a set of goods called inferior goods. Like a bus pass, like um, 
I don't know, used appliances, um, used furniture, right? It doesn't take a, you know, let your imagination run wild about things that you used to consume when you were really poor. Or if you're really poor right now, what are you consuming now that you will stop doing once you start getting more income? To go beyond economics here and to put yourself in a business mindset, you should know what kind of good you're selling if you're a business, right? If you're McDonald's, you might not like the fact that people are becoming richer because that could then mean that they're going to buy other goods. So you would want to use marketing and everything else to, you know, if you're a McDonald's to try to say, hey, we're not an inferior good, we're a normal good. Can't say it that explicitly, but that's what you would try to do. Okay, so now let's look at variable number three. So, what we're saying now is In variable number three, now we're talking about the prices of other products. And there, there are two other, there's two types of goods that I can purchase. Or there's two kinds of relationships that it can exist. Substitutes and complements. We all have pet peeves in this world. Mine is the proper spelling of compliments. It's with an E. Um, not with an I. An I would be compliments spelled with an I would be like saying, oh, that's a nice looking apple. Compliments with an E would be saying, I like peanut butter with my apples. Because compliments here means that the goods go together. Socks and shoes, left shoe and right shoe, right? Unless you're, right, unless you don't have two legs, right, you're probably buying left shoes and right shoes together. So much so, in fact, that the shoes are sold together as a pair. Just like pencils are sold with erasers, you know, built into the top of them. Um, you know, computers tend to be sold with a keyboard of some kind and a mouse. Um, cars are sold with tires. Substitutes, the relationship there is that um, the one good can replace the other. So if we stick with apples, we could think that a substitute could be an orange, right? If we're talking about fruits that can substitute each other, right? Or that a gala apple can replace a, um, I don't know, give me another kind of apple, All right? Like two, ap two types of apples probably are substitutes for each other or an orange with a clementine or um, something, right? Or frosted flakes and um, cinnamon toast crunch, that those can be substitutes for one another. But milk and cereal are complements to one another. And what we're saying here is that the price of the other good, the milk, can affect the demand for the cereal. Or that the price of complement, the substitute good, the price of clementines can affect the demand for oranges. That those two um, have a relationship with each other. Let's talk about what that relationship is.
if we're talking about the substitute relationship where the goods fulfill a similar need in some way, if the price, so let's think of it this way, substitutes, Q1 is related to Q2. The relationship when it's a substitute relationship is that when one goes up, the other goes down because one is replacing the other. For complements, for Q1 and Q2, the relationship is different. When one goes up, the other goes up because I use them together. Now related to each of these Qs is a P. What does the law of demand tell us? If Q1 is going up, then P1 must be going down. That's the law of demand. If Q2 is going down, then P2 must be going up. Law of demand. If Q1 is going up, P1 is going down. If Q2 is going up, P2 must be going down. And so what we're saying here, is that in one market, that we're gonna see a movement in one market and a change in the other. If I just tell you the clementines are getting cheaper. And thus more people are buying them. Then what I'm saying here is that in the orange market. So let's say that P2 is falling. people are going to buy fewer oranges. People are going to buy fewer oranges because they're buying clementines instead. They're substituting one for the other. There's a shift in the demand for oranges caused by a change in the price of clementines. In the complements market, so in other words, this is just to, to reiterate here. This is the first thing that happens, that the price of clementines falls. Quantity demanded of good two goes up. That's the law of demand. But this is not the law of demand because the law of demand is not explaining a shift of the demand curve that's occurring because more people are buying clementines. Let's look at compliments. Left shoe and right shoe. Seems about a very strong of a compliment relationship as you can get. Let's just do the same thing. Price is falling. Okay, so what do we know? Quantity demanded is going up for that product. So same movement, just as we had for clementines. But now, because there's a complementary relationship, now we're saying more people are buying right shoes. Let's say left shoes and right shoes can just be bought individually. So more people are buying right shoes. Well, what are they also going to need to buy because of this complementary relationship? they're gonna buy more left shoes as well. So there you can see why that type of relationship matters so much. Okay.
Um, let's not let's not worry about this economics of practice. This is tough enough without being distracted by um, this part in practice. Okay, taste and preferences. So this is a rather easy variable to look at. So this would be variable number four. Changes in preferences. So this one's easy. If people have a stronger preference for this product, right, a um, study comes out that says eating oranges makes you healthier, then the demand is going to increase at each and every price. Or if a study comes out that says oranges will kill you, a weaker preference, then the demand will be shifted inwards. Demand will decrease. So that's our taste and preferences. This is variable number four. Again, let's let's just focus on what we gotta get done here. Then, in terms of uh, variable number five, expectations. Um, is that variable? Sorry, I just want to make sure here. On the right number here. Oh, I see. They combined these. Sorry. So income, wealth, they counted them as separate. Sometimes they're counted together. Okay, so two, three, four, five, six. Sorry. So this is um, variable two. And three. Why not to confuse anyone here? Variable number four. And variable number five. And our one is six. expectations. What we do now is dependent on what we think our demand, uh, what the prices are going to be um, in the future and what the preferences are going to be in the future. Um, back when COVID in the summer wasn't as severe, I did buy a lot of tests and the rest of the country and the world was not buying that many tests. Just because I, I made a wild guess that um, there were going to be more variants, and at some point, people were going to want more tests. And I didn't think that um, – I had heard reports that uh, the test maker, Abbott Labs, was throwing away tests because they, they thought the market had collapsed and that we were all done with this. And I didn't think we were. So I was buying tests when no one else was because I anticipated that in the future, when I wanted to buy it, the price was going to be more expensive – or that it wouldn't be available. So in other words, what you would say if prices are expected to be higher I'll buy more because I want it at that cheaper price. Or if I'm expecting that future demand will be higher, um, that we'll see that higher price. I don't know, honestly, why the book or the chapter is waiting until now, slide 30, to finally highlight this for you. We talked about it. I think I already deleted it, but no, 
put it right here, slide 22. This right here is a movement. This right here is a shift. I don't know why they waited till here to go through a lot more stuff to make to, to wait until then to do it, but they did. Um, there we see that there. That the movement along the curve is an illustration. of our law of demand and that it can either look like that, which is an increase in quantity demanded, or it can look like this. which is a decrease in quantity demanded. Where are we seeing that, right? So the quantity is going down. Here the quantity is going up. Here it's caused by a change in the price of the good itself. Another way to write this out would be that you could say Q subscript D is increasing, Q subscript D is decreasing. That is different from here. Oh, and sorry, I should have said two. Um, this is just all caused by changing variable number one. That's changing the price right, right here. The alternative is here, where I'm changing variables two through six. Where I'm either increasing demand, or I'm decreasing demand. And while we shift those is determined by variables two through six, which we just reviewed. But they're very different. They look different. They're described differently. As you can see here, when we shift the curve, if this is a normal good and there's an increase in income, there's a higher quantity demanded at each and every price, such that it looks like that, caused by income increasing and this being a normal good. And this is just the way that it would look um, in a table. And then the way that we would see that graphically is this, shifting out, shifting from D0 to D1, shifting to the right, because it's a normal good. Okay, and there we just um, see this described again. I 
and variable number one. Variable number two through six. Sorry, why did I write two? Variable number one, variables number two through six. And then we just have a um, kind of some examples here. Um, and we'll do some, um, I'll make a separate video that will have some examples as well, just to make our life um, a little bit simpler. But um, the idea here would be that if I have an inferior good, again, that's kind of like taking the bus, then if my income goes up, my demand will shift to the left. Here they're talking about hamburger versus steak, hamburger being the inferior good. Um, I still like hamburger, so maybe that just means I'm a poor person still. Um, but the inferior good as income goes up, the demand shifts to the left. And that for a normal good, the demand shifts to the right when we're talking about uh, income increasing. And that's what we see right here. We also see um, the discussion of ketchup, which is the complement for a hamburger, that you would eat ketchup with a hamburger. And there we're saying that um, if the price of ketchup falls, people will buy more ketchup, but they need something to put it on, and they will put it on those hamburgers that they will buy more of. And as I said here, the thing that we have to caution ourselves with about this neoclassical model is that there is an assumption of methodological individualism, which basically means that we can assume It's an assumption that we can just add everyone up, which it's a bit controversial. Um, we wouldn't necessarily think that we can do that. And again, just keep in mind, we're having to build demand and supply because the, the, the neoclassical model is trying to build markets because those markets are critical to how a capitalist economy exists. And that's what we see right here. We can add up individual households to give us a total market demand curve. And that's what we see right here. Okay. Um, now, I will merge all these videos together. Uh, but at this point, um, I'm going to stop the video. Um, and then we'll go to the second part, which will be um, so now that we've completed our discussion of demand, then we'll move to our discussion of supply here, starting with slide 38. Okay, so now this would be effectively part two. So if you're watching this whole video as one big, very long video, this would be an appropriate time to kind of pause the video. Uh, but this basically picks up part two, which is supply. If you remember, we're doing demand, supply, and then bringing it all together and talking about the equilibrium. So um, our general description thus far Our general description thus far was one where the demand curve was downward sloping. 
could be explained by the law of demand. And we could have movements along that curve. And we could have shifts of that curve. Now, looking at it from the supplier's perspective, looking at firms making products where they're trying to earn a profit. So what would that mean? Well, firms want to make more money. How do they make more money? By charging higher prices. So that's going to have some influence here on, on um, how this exists. And we're going to structure this discussion of supply sim uh, similar to how we structured um, similar to how we structured demand. So one of the things that we're going to need to look at then is quantity supplied. Quantity supplied is going to be how much the firm is going to be willing and able to produce at any given price. And so um, what this firm is going to do is it's going to operate in the exact same space meaning it's going to operate in the PQ space. And what we're going to need to graph out are quantity supplied points, where the quantity supplied points are that at a very high price, the firm is going to be willing to supply quite a bit. So Q subscript S, or Q subscript S, stands for quantity supplied. And at very low prices, the firm is not going to want to supply a great deal. Let's call this QS2. Let's call it QS1. And we could imagine some points in the middle. So all of these would be quantity supplied points. And just like we did for demand, connect the dots, and you get a supply curve. So the supply curve is upward sloping, reflecting the willingness and ability of the firm to produce the product at any given price. The supply schedule would just give us some understanding of how the firm is going to be willing to supply the good in a tabular form. Okay. Well, just as we had a law of demand, um, this is always the uncomfortable part for me. Um, the book wants to make it sound like there's a law of supply. There's not really. Um, the book wants to say there is because it, it seems convenient and it aligns with the um, law of demand discussion. Uh, but, you know, for me personally, this is just a, a bridge I can't cross. Um, there is no law of supply. The reason why there is no law of supply, as we will learn later, is that firms are organized differently. They have different competitive structures. And so because they have different competitive structures, their price, their pricing ability is going to be different depending on the kind of firm that they are. There just is no convenient law of supply. Now, with that said, this is an introductory level course. At this point, for this introductory course, all I really care about is that you remember that demand is downward sloping and that supply is upward sloping. And you'd think that's pretty easy, but that is really my, um, my goal, that you remember that demand is downward sloping and that supply is upward sloping. 
if that's what it takes, that you believe that there's a law of supply that exists, so be it. Notice some of these same features. So I've got a ceteris parab assumption. That would be all things held constant. And now what we're saying is that there's a positive relationship between the price and the quantity supplied. Price and quantity supplied. When price goes up, firms are willing and able to supply more. When price goes down, firms are not as willing or able to sell the product. Direct relationship, positive relationship between the two. And it generates for us, for a given market, let's say oranges, that when the price is high, firms are going to grow a lot of orange trees. And when price is low, they're not going to want to sell a lot of oranges. They're going to be a lot of orange trees. And there we go. There's our supply curve. Just as we saw before, for that demand curve, here's a table where the price is going up and the firm is willing to supply more. And you see that right here. The supplier will supply more as time goes on. Um, the slope is positive. This is for an individual firm. We will also commit the crime of methodological individualism, but we will um, add up all of those supply curves to form a total market supply curve. And let's just um, uh, do we want to let's skip this slide for right now. This, this slide's important, but I think the, the book is getting ahead of itself when it does this. Here, supply is a function of price of the product, costs, prices of related products. And I'm not sure why the book doesn't add more here. Number of sellers, um, Price is expected in the future. Let's call that variable one, this variable two, this variable three, this variable four, and this variable five. So we'll need to cover all five of these variables to motivate the law of demand. The ceteris paribus applies to variables two through five. So for the law of supply, two through five are constant. And that's again because of ceteris paribus. Changes in variable one lead to changes in quantity supplied. And those two variables move in the same directions. As price goes up, quantity supplied goes up. As price goes down, 
quantity supplied goes down. Where number one here is referring to the prices. Or as I look at it here, it looks like P rice, it's prices. <laughs> Okay, so let's start to look at these. So, again, one of the important things um, is that we look at this in terms of movements versus shifts of the curve. Movement. That is described by our law of supply. It is simply saying that as the price goes up, quantity supply goes up. This would be a increase in quantity supply. Price goes up, quantity supply goes up. Or now as the price falls, the quantity supplied falls. This would be a decrease. in quantity supplied. And that's as that's counter to changing variables two through six. And what we will see is that some things will cause an increase in supply and we can also get a decrease in supply. And what we need to look at in the next two slides, it was is what causes those decrease and increases in supply. What variables have to move in what directions? But as you can see here, the same rules apply as we had for the um, our discussion of demand. That there is a difference when we say change in quantity supplied versus a change in supply. And that the law of supply only explains the movements along the curve. And that the um, change in supply is caused by something other than the price changing the price of the product itself changing. Okay. So here again is a um, table. And in that table, we can see that as the price is going up, that more is supplied but because of this change in technology a change in technology which makes the seeds now more disease resistant in essence this represents um, costs falling because now we am losing fewer seeds to disease right now more plants are going to grow out of the seeds. There's going to be less disease. And so what that means is that if I were to, well, what we're seeing here 
is that at each and every price, quantity supplied is increasing. Or you would just say supply increased, which would look like that. We're shifting to the right. And that's what we would see here. And we see this here. <laughs> At least you hear, got to hear me discuss it though, instead of having to watch it that way. So again, what that means is that at each and every price, quantity supplied increases. And we're seeing that here. If I were to draw a series of horizontal lines, at e, well, I were to draw these lines straight, at each and every price, the quantity supplied is increasing. Okay, and again, just as I said for um, demand, I'm not sure whether they're only showing you this slide now. They should have showed it to you earlier, but for whatever reason, they decided to show it to you now. Same rules apply. Um, I, it, what this slide says is important. I just think they should have told it to you sooner. You have to distinguish very important to distinguish between movements along the curve, that's our law of supply, and shifts in the curve, that's a change in supply. Again, those look different. And Slide 44, which is right here, shows you that description again of the difference between the two. I just don't know why they're deciding on slide 47 to repeat what was they had initially started to see on slide 44, but they did. Um, we can add up those supply curves to form a market curve. And that will get us our market supply. And um, what that does for us is it allows us to, um, um, well, we add those up. So we would see that right here where we add up each of the individual firms to start to um, come up with a market. Now, I don't know the reason why um, the slides, they don't want to go over variables two through six. So I'm going to be inserting um, five new slides so that we can cover those variables and look at how the supply curve shifts. So let me go back to here so I can keep the same order. So we're gonna have variable two being cost. We kind of looked at that already, but I'm just gonna repeat it again. Variable three being the price of related products. Variable four, being number of sellers, variable five being prices expected in the future. Okay, so I'm just writing that down so that I stick to that order of variables.
And I'm going to insert slides here. One, two, three, four, and five. Okay. So again, costs, we already looked at. If costs are falling, then the firm would be able to earn profit, the same level of profit, at a lower price. So if costs fall, then the supply curve will shift to the right. It will increase. If costs rise, let's say because the minimum wage goes up or something like that, then the supply curve will decrease. They will now not be willing to provide as much at each and every price. And the supply decreases. Okay, variable two, or sorry, variable three. We also have prices of related products in terms of the production side of this. And that would be that a firm also has substitutes and complements in production. So it would be a complement in production. Oregon is full of wood, right? Um, from what I hear, lots and lots of wood. Well, what does that create, right? So if I'm trying to create long boards of wood, then right, I get all these like, um, uh, what do you call it? I get all the um, like wood chips and stuff. Well, as you might also know, um, some companies take those wood chips, glue them all together and make particle board. So that would be a complement in production. It's something that's produced as a byproduct of producing something else. Just like if I want to make, um, if I own a leather factory, right, and I have all these cows giving me their skin so that I can make <laughs> a leather jacket, then the complement in production would also be beef, right? It could also be milk, I guess, if I don't kill the cows fast enough. So all of those would be things where the price of the related product is going to determine how much the supply is going to be. So let's look at, only because it's an extreme example, Sorry, all you vegetarians, for this description here. Think of them as the byproducts of each other, right? To produce leather, I also have to produce beef. And the more leather I produce, the more beef I produce. If the price of leather whereas this looks like pleather, if the price of leather is falling, then the quantity supplied of leather would do what? Fall. Supply of beef will also fall. because I'm not going to make as much leather. So there's just not going to be as much beef out there as there once was. If the price 
of leather increased. Then from the law of supply, we know that the quantity supplied of leather would increase. And as they produce more leather, the supply of beef would increase. So for beef, it would shift out. Sorry, that's just a bad color to have picked. And that the supply curve for beef shifted to the right because something other than the price of beef changed. In fact, it was the price of the leather that changed that caused all this. We could also have the substitutes in production. So whereas complements in production are by producing one product, I have a byproduct of another product. Now for substitutes in production, what we're saying is that my assembly line that's used to make cars could also be used to make motorcycles or my assembly line that's used to make boats could also be used to make submarines. I don't know. I'm just kind of making it up here. Um, but these would all be things that, um, these, these would be things that could serve as, um, th that could, um, help the firm determine what to produce or not. So this, which again is variable number three. So let's say that, I don't know, let's just make it easy here. Cars and motorcycles. Now, again, let me just be very clear here, and I'll just say it one more time. We're not talking about these as being substitutes in consumption. Substitute in consumption, which these also, in fact, are, but um, not in this example. But a substitute in consumption would say, I can drive to work in a car, or I can drive to work on a motorcycle. Yes, that's true. They are substitutes in consumption but they are also substitutes in production, meaning that the firm can decide to produce cars and they can use the same assembly line to produce motorcycles. And so if the price of cars falls, then we know from the quantity supplied that it will also fall for cars. but that the supply of motorcycles will increase because now the firm, instead of producing all those motorcycles, or sorry, all those cars, will now just produce motorcycles because the car market, things are so cheap. And so how that would look as a graph For motorcycles, the supply curve would shift to the right. Even though in the car market, the firm is not able to capture as much money. So they supply less. This is law of supply. So law of supply is happening here. Law of supply is happening here. We're just having to jump ahead to talk about the supply curve itself. Okay, number four. 
number of sellers. This one's pretty easy. If I have more sellers, it'll increase my supply. Fewer sellers. And I will see a decrease in supply. Okay. And variable number five. I don't know why I did, I did one too many here. And then variable number five. Price is expected in future. If prices are expected to rise, then firms are probably going to hold off. Their current production. So we'll see a decrease in supply. And if prices are expected to fall, then firms are going to want to sell their product as much as they can right now. And so we'll see an increase in supply. Okay, so this ends now part two. And then um, we still have part three to go. Okay, so now this... If you're still watching this video, this represents now, I should make it a Roman numeral here. This represents part three. So again, we did demand in part one, and we did supply, and now we put it all together. Equilibrium. What does equilibrium mean? It's the point where quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. And where there's no, I don't know why I'm crossing a D here, there's no tendency for change. Putting it on the same graph, We see the equilibrium price, and we see the equilibrium quantity. So this is now the um, capitalist description of how markets exist. What is what I like about this picture is that it does uncover the mystery of why things are priced the way that they are. And that also at this price, because the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied, there's neither a shortage nor a surplus. Now let's just add a new slide here. Let's draw something a little bit wider. So 
So Q star, quantity demanded star, P star. So here's our equilibrium price and quantity. And so the question would be is, how do we find this price? Like, how would we know where it is? Let's say, for instance, that the price is right here. So the price is really, really high compared to the equilibrium. At P2, quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded, right? Here's quantity supplied, here's quantity demanded. This is what we would call a surplus. Now, how do companies respond to a surplus? They typically put things on sale, right? Because they just made too much. So the price falls. So firms react to this, right? So if they guess that the price is going to be P2, they clearly got it wrong. We can see that they got it wrong because of this picture, but they don't know that yet. The only way they know that P2 is too high is because a surplus exists. So the price falls. It's reduced by the firm. in an attempt to get rid of that surplus. As the price falls, what do we know? From the law of demand and, sorry. I'm not gonna erase it. Just, I'm sorry, I just miswrote it there. And from the law of supply, meaning I move along the curve and I keep moving until I get the equilibrium. Total curve over increments. That's why I kind of drew several arrows here. What about at P3? At P3, now the quantity demanded exceeds the quantity supplied. Here's the quantity demanded. Here is the quantity supplied. This would be what we call a shortage. How do firms respond to shortages? Well, we should certainly know this under COVID. Is that the price rises? It's increased by the firm. So as the price goes up, we know from the law of demand that the quantity demanded will fall. And as the price goes up, we know from the law of supply that the quantity supplied will go up. In other words, now, as the price gets incrementally increased from P3, we move to the equilibrium. This, my friends, is a beautiful picture. If you are considering getting a tattoo to memorialize you taking this class, this would be what I would suggest that you ink your body with. This, for me, who is a somewhat questioning neoclassical, this right here is the process of price discovery. What I like about it is that if you believe in markets and the power of a market in a capitalist system, at least the market would present to you, right? If we um, ignore the fact that there is not class harmony and cooperation, what is nice about this is that no one is dictating to you what the price is. The price is simply determined by the intersection of demand and supply. There is no such thing as a right price or a just price. There's just one price, the equilibrium price. And as long, now this is the Adam Smith part of this. 
as long as the market is not interfered with, the markets will tell you what the equilibrium price is on their own because of the existence of shortages and surpluses. When there's a surplus, the price will eventually fall. When there's a shortage, the price will eventually rise. The only thing that can screw this picture up, at least according to the capitalist and Adam Smith, would be if the government gets involved and stops the price from changing. In other words, that the um, government imposes a price control of some kind, like a minimum wage, like a rent control. These would be things that would cause permanent disequilibriums in a market. As long as we let the market sort itself out, the market will tend eventually to get to the equilibrium point. Oh, this is going to really hurt your back when you're tattooing this on your back. Okay. And so that's what we see right here. Right here, we've got the excess demand, or another word for it would be the shortage. Because of the shortage existing, the price will be driven upwards up to the equilibrium price. And then we've got our excess supply. I'm just going to just, because I've already talked about this, you, you don't need me to um, talk about this more here. But when a surplus exists, again, the price is too high. So for that supply, that surplus, the price will fall. And we would see that right here. And the price will fall until it reaches the equilibrium. And again, you would put that all together to get my beautiful picture right here. Now, we can also solve this with equations. Um, I'm going to make your life a little easier. So let's just skip one and two here. Let's just focus on three. In fact, I, I do want to make your life, because this can get complicated pretty quick. Let's just skip that. Let's skip this. Let's just jump to the third one. So the idea here is that you can describe the demand function and the supply function with a function, mathematical function. And if I want to find the equilibrium price and quantity, I merely need to set the equations equal to each other. So my 14 minus 2p will be equal to 2 plus 4p. Add 2p, add 2p, subtract 2, subtract 2. Price would equal 2. Now I need to find the um, quantity. And I can put that into either the demand function or the supply function. Doesn't matter which one. Quantity would equal 14 minus 2 times 2. Or it would equal 14 equals 2 plus 4 times 2 is 10. And there you go. Now I could uh, ask a different question. 
How much is the surplus? When the price is five. So now what I would need to do is that quantity demanded would equal 14 minus 2 times 5, which would equal 4. And quantity supplied would be 2 plus 4 times 5, which is 22. Quantity supplied minus the quantity demanded would be my surplus. So 22 minus 4, I would have a surplus of 18. And you could do that same math to find the amount of the shortage. And then the final part of this would be what's called comparative statics. or changes in equilibrium. And I'll be honest, um, since many of you are business students, this third part of the third chapter is one of the primary reasons, not the only reason, but it's a very important reason for why business executives and whatnot think that economics is so important because what we can do with the knowledge that we have from this chapter is that now we can predict changes in the equilibrium for example What if I tell you that the tractor price goes up and I want to know what's going to happen in the corn market? So here's my P, here's my Q. In some sense, demand is unaffected. There's nothing about the demand function that has anything to do with tractor prices going up. Here's my original supply, but now because of this, the costs are going up for the firm. How do you shift the curve when costs go up? It causes a decrease in supply. Which means now I can say that there's going to be less corn on the shelves and the price of corn is going to be higher. You see how useful that would be for a company that makes corn or popcorn? Right? Orville Redenbacher is going to be pretty darn happy knowing that you took this econ class because he's going to know now that you know that when tractors go up in price, it means I should charge more for my popcorn. So this is one where just the supply curve is decreasing. Let's do another one. Let's keep the same market, corn. Let's have one now where the demand is increasing, like it would here, where I come out with a study that says corn is healthy for you to eat. It's not, but let's just say that it is. That would shift out my demand curve. Causing an increase in the price. Again, study comes out. Now, Orville Redenbacher is happy who you are, having taken this class. Because now, you've accurately predicted that the price will go up and people will buy more. So here... Equilibrium price went up, quantity fell. Here, price went up, quantity increased. Okay, now, if 
for this corn market. Let's presume that there are fewer sellers, sorry, more sellers of the corn. So people decide to get into this corn racket. And they decide to, so now the change is more sellers, more farmers. Now the consequence is that my price is falling and my quantity is rising. And then finally, right, so I have an event causing this, one of these curves to shift here, supply decreased. Here, demand increased. Here, supply increased. So now I'm going to want my supply to decrease. Sorry, um, increase. Sorry. So to get my supply to increase, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, that looks messy. Sorry about that. I want my demand to fall. How would I get demand to fall? Well, I could have income falling in this be a normal good. And so in this corn market, then the demand will decrease. And that would mean that the equilibrium price falls and that the quantity falls. So those circled parts here are the predictions that you can now make when one of the curves is shifting. Unfortunately, it's not usually that simple that just one curve shifts. So here's a, an example again, where you have the supply curve decreasing. Causing the equilibrium price to go up. Let's skip this for right now. Um, The problem emerges when you shift multiple curves. Um, I am not sure why in these remaining slides they don't want to show you all the other options. So. Let's have supply increase and demand increase. I don't care what the changes are. Let's just say um, let's say that the price of a complement falls. And for supply increasing, let's say that costs fall. Now, when you have two curves shifting, things unfortunately get a little more complicated. In fact, we're going to need to draw three graphs. Demand and supply. Demand and supply, demand and supply. Because 
the reason why I have to have three pictures is because I need to know, I'm not told how much these curves are shifting by. So what if they shift the same amount? Then supply increases and demand increases. And I tried to increase them about the same amount. Sorry, it's not going to look. Exactly parallel because I'm not a very good drawer. But now I shifted them by the same amount. So if they shift the same amount, the same magnitude of the shift, the equilibrium price did not change at all, but the equilibrium quantity increased. What if supply shifted more than demand? So big, huge increase in supply. Very small increase in demand. Now my equilibrium looks different. Look. Now my price is falling, my quantity is still rising. What if demand shifts more than supply? So now what if my demand goes like that, my supply doesn't shift as much. And here's my old equilibrium, here's my new equilibrium. Now my equilibrium price is going up, my quantity is still going up. In all three cases, equilibrium quantity went up. Price, we don't know. We need more information because it could go up, it could go down, or it could stay the same. I would have to tell you something like demand shifted more than supply or you know some other words that identify how things are changing. Now, in the interest of time, I'll say to you that um, you can draw this for the others. Do one for supply and demand both decreasing, one for supply increasing and demand decreasing, one for um, demand increasing, supply decreasing. And you'll see that one variable will move ambiguously because we don't really know we don't know what it will do we need more information but there'll be one variable i spelled that wrong but i'm not going to fix it there's going to be one variable that moves in an unambiguous fashion meaning it always changes in the same direction whether the shifts are more or less than each other and in this case, it was quantity. Quantity always went up regardless. Price was ambiguous because we need more information. It could be any one of these three scenarios if I don't tell you how much the relative shift is. Okay, so you can read these here. Um, they give you, so we have a review here. Um, but I'll let you read those on your own. Okay. So this is a very um, long and complicated chapter. Um, we will do um, um, some practice questions just to kind of help our understanding of this.